hoax ostrich egg. Whoop. There we go. All right. Next up, with another fantastic animal interest story, we have Bronica DiCarlo to tell us all about the thylacine and whether it is a wolf, tiger, or devil. The last poop. It's all mine. So, thylacine. Is it a wolf? What do I do? There we go. How adorable is that thing? But is it a wolf, a tiger, or a devil? Dun, dun, dun. It's not even remotely correct. So, it's been called a Tasmanian tiger, a zebra wolf, a Tasmanian wolf, zebra possum, native hyena, wolf kangaroo, a lot of things in those veins, but none of them were actually right. It is not a canine, a feline, a zebra, or a hyena. In fact, if you want to get more accurate, it's more like this guy. <laughs> See, their closest relatives were actually the Tasmanian devil or the coal. And uh, the, the name is, sorry, Latin. Thylacinus sinocephalus means dog-headed pouch one because they're actually marsupials. <laughs> they're a really good example of parallel evolution. They're the only species of this marsupial family to exist in modern times, and also the largest and the last of the carnivorous marsupials. Um, they're an apex predator that occupied a similar place in the ecosystem as a wolf, so they developed a lot of similar characteristics. And if you look closely to their skull shape, from, di from a distance they look really similar, but up close you can see their jaws are really different. The thylacines were much smaller, and this will come into play later. Basically, uh, they were accused of being sheep killers, but their jaws were actually too weak to take down sheep. They were, their teeth were made for slicing, not for crushing bone. It's, it's an important distinction. They're not really actually that close to dogs, even though they look like them. And look at that mouth. They had the largest gape of any mammal. <laughs> kind of looks like something out of Beetlejuice, right? <laughs> So they're about four and a half to six feet long, about two feet tall at the shoulders. This is one compared to a dog. So you can see a lot of the similar similarities and differences. Males had bigger heads, females had smaller. They had shorter legs, thinner muzzle, and the tails are the big difference. So you know how dogs have that really great tail that wags, it kind of can separate from the rest of the spine in movement? They had kangaroo tails, actually. It tapered down and was uh, mostly hairless, as were the backs of their legs, and they were known to occasionally hop in a kangaroo-like way. <coughs> they hunted mostly at night, uh, though they were seen moving around during the day, hanging out, sunning on rocks, and they lived in eucalyptus forests, wetlands, grasslands, and were entirely carnivorous, hunting small animals, and able to take in a lot of food when hunting was scarce. Had that nice distendable stomach a lot of carnivores had. They had a backwards facing pouch, the females did. Um, kangaroos, wallabies, upward facing marsupials have one in the front. Uh, thylacines and any of the four legged ones have one that come out the back. In this picture, you can see the little bitty tail, the baby one. Um, <laughs> the males also had a pouch. They had a literal ball sack, just a little bitty one, and a fork penis. Fun facts. <laughs> Females would, be care would carry the joeys for one to three months. Um, their lifespans were about five to seven years, reportedly up to nine in captivity, but we'll get into why that's probably not true either later on. <laughs> not much else is known about the reproductive cycles because they kind of died out before a lot of studying was done. There's been some dissection of the uh, few specimens that remain, but not all that much. So they're 33 to 77 pounds, had 13 to 22 stripes running down their body, which is why they got all the weird zebra and tiger names. Coarse, short, dense gray-brown fur with kind of a yellow olive undertone with some white markings around the face. And just, they're freaking adorable. <laughs> they, so they knew they existed in Australia because there's fossils, there's aboriginal art, but they disappeared about two to 3,000 years ago. Nobody knows for sure why. Um, 
probably dingoes and man, possibly cl climate change and disease. But in either way, they lived on in Tasmania and New Guinea, but in a very small population, two to 3,000 animals in uh, Tasmania as of 1803. They are first described by European settlers in the Sydney Gazette in 1805. And as in the time period, this is a ridiculously long run-on sentence. So, <laughs> an animal of a truly singular and novel description was killed by dogs on the 30th of March on a hill immediately contiguous to the settlement at Yorktown, Port Dalrymple, from the following minute description of which Lieutenant Gov Governor Patterson, it must be considered of a species perfectly distinct from any of the animal creation hitherto known, and certainly the only powerful and terrific of the carnivorous and voracious tribe yet to be discovered on any part of New Holland or its adjacent islands. New Holland being what they called Australia before it was called Australia. So we're gonna get to the sheep killer thing. Tasmania is a lot of sheep farmers and a lot of sheep were dying. Nobody looked at the wild dogs running around. They said this big weird animal that nobody's ever seen before must be a vicious killer and must be slaughtering all of them. So let's kill all of them. There was a, a lot of Bounty schemes. The, the government, the main government of Tasmania had one from 1888 to 1909 with one pound for an adult animal, skin or head, and 10 shillings for a juvenile, which was a fortune back then. Trappers can make way more money killing thylacines than they could with anything else, so they're a prime target. There was also a lot of smaller local bounties running as well, so even if you couldn't walk all the way to where you have to turn in for the government, you can go to your local office. These ran for a long time, almost to the end. In fact, by the time the bounties ended, there were barely any thylacines left to turn in. It wasn't just the hunting, it was also a disease similar to distemper and mange that affected them in the late 19th and early 20th century as well. The species declined very, very quickly, and uh, yeah, by the time the bounty programs ended, it was pretty much already too late. They were displayed in some zoos, and uh, penny arcades, carnivals, county fairs in Europe, the US, the UK, Australia, and India. Many of them that were captured died very suddenly, uh, mostly from shock. They did not do well in captivity, only bred successfully once, and were not known to be easily tamed. In the wild, they actually avoided humans as much as possible unless they were cornered, though there's some anecdotal stories of them possibly attacking small children. The famous naturalist John Gould published his prediction of their extinction in Mammals of Australia in 1863. When the comparably small island of Tasmania becomes more densely populated and its primitive forests are inter intersected with roads from the eastern to western coasts, the numbers of this singular animal will speedily diminish. Extermination will have its full sway and it will then, like the wolf of England and Scotland, be recorded as an animal of the past. The only other scientist who seemed concerned over the rapid decline was T.T. Flynn, a professor of biology at the University of Tasmania. In 1914, he recommended catching as many as possible and putting them on an island. Since the island they were already on was not really working out for them, let's find them another one. Unfortunately, he was turned down. By the time the Animal and Bird Protection Board passed a motion to protect them in 1929, it was already very close to the end, and the motion is just to protect him for the month of December. <laughs> the last thylacine that was shot in the wild was in May of 1930. The last one that was captured was in 1933 in the Florentine Valley. He is referred to as Benjamin. He was, uh, they've since proven that he is male and that his name was Benjamin. There was some discussion about that. Um, two short films were actually made of him that you can find on YouTube if you look up Last Thylacine. He's so cute. I couldn't bet it is. He's adorable. And you can actually see sometimes him sitting on his back legs and his tail. The motions are a lot different from a cat or a wolf if you actually see them move. Uh, he unfortunately died of exposure. In, um, it was a very, very cold night and a zookeeper forgot to let him into his nighttime habitat. He died 59 days after the species was finally granted protected status. 
So thylacines are honored a lot more now than they were when they were alive. September 7th is National Threatened Species and Thylacine Day in Australia. They declared it 60 years on the anniversary of Benjamin's death. They've been honored in everything from stamps to cartoons to furry porn. <laughs> Highest accolade. <laughs> There's also a lot of sightings being reported all the time, including this week. Most have been disproved. Some of them were like photos that were recolored or this kind of stuff where, you know, <laughs> you have no idea what that actually is. Probably not a thylacine. Though, on a happy note, they are a candidate for de-extinction. That means uh, they're trying to clone them. Once they get the full genome, which there is some... Um, some rumors that they have recently, they can put it into a Tasmanian devil egg and then hopefully, actually, bring them back. They were gonna have the same problems of low de gene uh, sorry, genetic diversity, still it's a start, and who knows, maybe there are a couple wild ones running around out there. Either way, there is some actual hope for the species to return. S science, go science, seriously. So let's raise our glass to this misunderstood devil, accused of being a vicious killer, but really just wanted to be left alone by us. They're lost for now, but they may not be gone forever. And let us hope that if by some slim chance the scientists do bring them back, we can finally do right by this unique, beautiful, and misunderstood species.